In this video today, I'm going to demonstrate all the processes that are needed to repair a broken Christmas ornament. This Christmas ornament is a Temaku glaze, broken relatively cleanly in half. What you'll notice though is when I put it back together, there's some small areas of glaze loss up here on the lip, on the transition from the glaze and unglazed area on both sides. You can see some glaze missing uh, along the crack here. You know, typically when a piece breaks, the, the glaze does uh, occasionally flake off and pressure flake off. Uh, in order to start this repair process, I'm going to start by mixing my epoxy. You can do this either in a cup or on a flat surface or flat tile. I like to use a flat tile personally. Um, the epoxy that we are using in this kit uh, is an FDA compliant food grade epoxy. This particular epoxy mixes at a 2 to 1 ratio. I do have two different FDA compliant epoxies that I use uh, in the studio. One mixes 1 to 1, one mixes 2 to 1, but this particular one mixes 2 to 1. And and because I'm not concerned about this being a food safe repair, I'm going to do the volumes by uh, drops coming out of the tube. Two drops of part A to one drop of part B. Uh, it's, it's pretty close. I, if I was doing this and it was a food grade repair, I would actually use a small scale um, that weighs to the hundredth of a gram. That way I can be accurate in my repair. Um, most of the time, if I'm mixing large volumes, I will mix with a palette knife. In this instant, I decided to use a toothpick because it is such a minor amount of material that I'm going to need to repair this ornament. Um, the important thing is that you spend a good amount of time mixing your epoxy. That way it incorporates well and it cures properly. A big thing to note with this epoxy is the fact that this epoxy actually takes over 24 hours to cure, 24 to 48 hours to be exact, and doesn't fully cure uh, until seven days. So it's a really long cure epoxy. So the upside of it is it gives you a really good long work time, um, like you would want to work if you were working with uh, a traditional Kintsugi repair using a Rushi. Now, if I was using a Rushi here, what I would be doing slightly different is a Rushi, in order to glue things together, you make something called Mugi Rushi. Mugi Rushi is a combination of wheat flour, or in some instances uh, rice flour, but mugi rushi in particular is wheat flour, and you mix it with the lacquer. Now because I have my epoxy already mixed, um, I'm going to go through the process of gluing this piece together. I want to pick up small amounts of material and uh, put it on the edge, and, and actually apply it as thin as possible. You don't need thick coatings. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm picking up a small amount of the epoxy with the back end of this toothpick, and I'm spreading it out as thin as I can along the break. Uh, if it was a large piece with a thicker cross section, I may end up using a palette knife both to mix uh, the epoxy and to apply it on the surface. Palette knives work really, really, really good uh, in that instance. Um, but they also work really well at, at cleaning up work at the end. I mentioned Mugi Arushi a little bit earlier. So what Mugi Arushi is, is it's what you use to glue anything together in traditional kintsugi. Different people have slightly different recipes, um, but that being said, there's a, a general rule of thumb that you can use if you're doing traditional rushi-based um, kintsugi. Um, what typically is done during this phase is you mix wheat flour with uh, equal amounts of water and you make essentially a paste. With that paste, you then end up pressing the water out, usually using a paper towel just to absorb excess moisture, and then you mix an equal portion of urushi to the wheat slash water paste that you had made. And what that does is it forms a really, really, really good adhesive. Um, the wheat flour uh, acts as a temporary bond agent because the urushi has to cure in high humidity and typically takes anywhere between 24 hours and seven days to cure. Uh, depending upon humidity and, and temperature, um, normally you let it cure for one to two days before you move on to your next step after repair is done. Now in this repair, because this is porcelain and I'm not going to be getting a whole lot of absorption, and also the piece is not going to be put under stress of expansion and contraction caused by excess heat with boiling water or something like that, um, I'm not going to be putting additional epoxy on the opposite side. Uh, if this was going to be used for heat, I would. Now. At this stage, I want to make sure that I get the two halves lined up perfectly. If I have a piece with multiple breaks, I would be basically getting everything coated with epoxy and then putting it together one piece at a time. And what I'm doing is I'm pushing these pieces together. As you can see right now, with a little bit of epoxy that I put in, you can see that epoxy bulging out of the cracks. That lets me know that my coverage was good and I have enough material to make a really good strong bond. 
in order to ensure a good bond, you want to make sure that you have good compression on the piece as it cures. Rubber bands work great for this. Now, the downside with rubber bands, if you don't get them on quite right, they could someone slip off, especially in an ornament shape. As you notice, I'm having difficulty with this rubber band. I'll try it again. Get it stretched around. Try to hold it in place as best I can and get it wrapped around so that I have a good connection uh, holding the piece together. The tension from the rubber band will keep everything nice and tight. Keep pressure on those joints while the epoxy cures. Now, you'll notice that there's some little smearing towards the top where there's some excess epoxy coming out. I could just temporarily wipe it off now. The other thing that I can do is I can let it cure and then cut it off. I'm going to put another rubber band on for additional strength. And then what I'm going to do once I have this on, if I can get it on, um, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, get a, you know, just a piece, small piece of paper towel and actually wipe off um, the excess adhesive. I, I don't want to have too much excess adhesive, mainly because if I'm handling it at any point beyond this, um, I don't want to smear it around. Like I mentioned, the little excess here, you could see where I touched it when I was putting the rubber bands on. I don't want to have to clean that up after the fact, so I'm going to clean up some of it now. Um, you don't always have to clean it up. If you don't smear it like I did when I put on the rubber bands, you don't need to take the time to wipe it off. But I'm going to go through this process of just wiping down the surface, uh, removing any excess to make sure that it's nice and clean. It has been about 36 hours since I put the rubber bands on the piece and I've let it cure. Uh, after about 24 hours, rubber bands can be removed. The epoxy is relatively hard. You'll notice though, if you are working with it 24 hours afterwards, that the epoxy on the surface may seem a little bit rubbery. Um, after 36 hours, it is a little bit harder. Uh, I typically try to work within the first 24 to 48 hours after I apply the epoxy. And what I've done here is I've pulled out a couple additional things from my Kintsugi kit. Um, a palette knife and some water uh, that I will end up using with my uh, wet dry sandpaper in a second. What I'm doing right now is I'm going over the surface in any area where I can feel the epoxy raised on the surface. I'm going through and I'm removing it by cutting it back. Um, it's best to do this uh, within the first 48 hours of a repair, typically, like I said, between 24 and 48 hours because the epoxy cuts off relatively easy, easily. Uh, you can do it after that point in time. It just is a little bit harder and you may end up needing to use uh, something a little bit more aggressive like a razor blade or an exacto blade. Um, but as you can see here, I'm pushing off some excess, just going back and forth using the sharp edge of the palette knife to remove material. Um, the other thing that's nice about the palette knives is they're semi-flexible so I can bend them around the curvature of a shape. Once you have most of the excess cut away, uh, what you want to do is you want to end up going through and cleaning up the surface. How good a Kintsugi repair looks often has to do with how much cleanup work is done in between steps. Uh, here I'm using sandpaper to help further refine my uh, repair. Uh, what's provided in the kit is 400, 1000, and 1500 grit wet dry sandpaper. You want to use wet dry sandpaper and actually actively use water because it helps prevent dust getting airborne that can then get into your lungs or on your skin. Uh, with the epoxy, it's not as much of a worry uh, when it's cured, but with Urushi, if this was a Urushi based repair, uh, Urushiol can cause, or Urushi can cause Urushiol contact dermatitis. It's essentially just like poison oak and poison ivy. And I know a couple artists who actually, when they were first learning the process of Kintsugi, because of sanding the surface and not using wet sandpaper, not wearing gloves, um, ended up getting contact dermatitis either on their hands or people who were sanding and, and wearing gloves uh, ended up getting it on their face. I was actually at a craft fair recently and one of the, the painters had learned makie in Japan and makie is the, the technique of applying uh, gold uh, onto the surface of Urushi. It's actually the step that's used in the final stages of traditional kintsugi. And she was telling me that when she learned the process, she ended up with horrible poison oak style rash, erucial contact dermatitis on her face. And it was because of the way that she was uh, cleaning up her, her work um, and just not being careful enough about the dust. The wet, dry sandpaper helps to minimize that airborne dust. What I've done is I've sanded the entire surface with 400 grit. I've then wiped the surface dry and clean. And then I'm moving on to my next grit of 1000. Uh, like I said, the further that you can refine your repair, the further you can make that crack smooth, the better your piece is going to look. Now, 
This has been cleaned up pretty well already with the 400 grit and me cutting it off. So what I'm doing right now is I'm just giving it a little bit of a nice polishing buff. A concern that people have sometimes is, well, you're sanding the glaze on the piece. Uh, the answer to that is yes, but the grits that I'm using here after that 400 grit, the 1000 grit and 1500 grit are so fine. If they're used properly, you can actually use them to sand out dings in glass or potters sometimes will use them to sand out imperfections in porcelain. The 1000 and 1500 grit are such fine sandpapers that I'll often use them in sanding my ceramic glazes just to polish the surface a little bit more than they get during the actual firing, firing process. Not in this instance with Temaku would I, but if it were a Shino or another more rustic glaze, I may end up sanding or wood fire piece sanding the person with these fine grits in order to make it have a really nice surface. Now if we look at the ornament here and we rotate it around, we want to notice any areas where there's missing glaze. So if we look in the light, you'll see there's small little gapping. You can see it as I rotate the ornament a little bit in the light. Uh, a little gapping here on the lip. There was a little gapping on the glaze on the far side. You can see some more gapping on that side. Right here, you can see there's a section maybe one or two millimeters wide of gapping. I'm trying to point to it with my palette knife as best I can. And as I rotate the ornament on the bottom, you'll see there's some flaked, flaked glazes, pressure flaked, almost like if you were making obsidian stone tools. Now, you can't just fill that with liquid epoxy. Well, you can, but it's probably not going to give you a, a, a smooth surface. What's used in traditional kintsugi is something called sabi. Um, here, we're going to end up using a two-part epoxy that is meant to uh, replace sabi. Uh, sabi in traditional kintsugi is essentially a combination of a clay dust, sometimes tonoko, sometimes jinoko. There's a couple different materials that do get used. Um, and just like the movie Yurushi that was mentioned earlier, you end up mixing that clay dust with water, um, equal parts, and then you end up dewatering it by using a paper towel to dry it out, and then you end up mixing equal amounts of Arushi with it, and you use that as a fill material. Here, we're gonna end up using, uh, like I said, a two-part epoxy. Now, we don't need a whole lot of this material. Um, a lot of the times, people will mix up too much material, and then you're basically throwing out material, because once you mix it together, uh, it has a short shelf life and you can't reuse the material after it has cured. That's both in the sabi using traditional arushi and tonoko powder and water and also in these two part epoxies. So what you're going to notice is I'm pulling out very small amounts of material um, here from my, from my bags of two part epoxy and I want these to be relatively equal. This material mixes uh, in equal parts, one to one by volume. So you want to try to get pieces that are the same size. Now you can see here that my red is a little bit more than the gray. You know, if you take too much out, it's okay. Just remove the excess of one or add a little bit more of the other. Uh, in order to mix this, I want to make sure my gloves are nice and tight. I'm going to pinch it out, roll it together, check. Uh, try to make sure I got about equal amounts of the two. It just cures better if I do. Uh, once you have equal amounts of the uh, two materials, uh, you just want to knead it together with your fingers. Um, I typically will wear gloves anytime I'm working with both Arushi and any type of epoxy. Epoxies do and can cause uh, an allergic uh, reaction in people's skin, can cause an allergic dermatitis just like the Arushi can. Um, so it is something to be aware of. So anytime that I'm working with epoxy uh, and Arushi both, I make sure that I wear gloves. So I'm just trying to go through and knead everything that I can, making sure that my color mixes up and gets nice and uniform. The uniformity of color, if I don't see any marbling within it, ensures that I have a nice, even mix. And what that's going to do is that's going to ensure that I have a good cure time and good strength in my cure. This material cures in approximately 30 minutes to an hour. You have about 30 minutes of working time and then an hour to, to cure where it's hard and you can sand. And what I'm going to end up doing is that I'm going to push it into any of those voids. Um, with the back end of the palette knife or side of a palette knife, I will scrape away uh, any excess material. I can then use the material that's adhered to my palette knife to uh, put into the crack next door. And so as I go through this process, I'm just going to slowly fill any areas and smooth any areas out. Um, where I had any of that pressure flaking and or cracking and or gapping in my glaze and clay body underneath. Now if I was doing this traditionally, like I mentioned earlier, I would use sabi, that combination of clay dust, uh, sometimes it's charcoal dust, and sometimes uh, 
sawdust even, depending upon how much material needs to be filled in. And what I would do is I would have that material mixed up. Its work time is, you know, about 30 minutes to, to 45 minutes, just like this epoxy is. And I would go through this process in a similar manner using palette knives. I like palette knives because they're small and I have a lot of control with them. Oftentimes, traditional kintsugi artists in Japan, they will actually use uh, cedar paddles. Uh, I don't know if paddles is the right term for it, but there are split sheets of of cedar they're basically fashioned almost like a spatula used in cooking uh, tapering from a narrow edge uh, on the back but thicker to a wider edge in the front that is thinner and it's used for both mixing arushi and uh, applying uh, sabi and applying uh, mugi arushi you know it's used for many things but i also know some kintsugi artists that actually they'll put their application using uh, like i did earlier with this with a toothpick. I mean, the reality is, you know, you use the tools that either you're trained with or the tools that you are comfortable with. And ceramics, oftentimes, ceramic artists that I know in Japan make their own tools. Their trim tools are made out of a strip of banding still, uh, bent at a 45, shaped to an angle, and then ground down to a sharp knife edge. Uh, it's, you know, something pretty common. You, know, you use the tools that you're used to, or if there's not a tool that uh, you've been trained with and you want a tool specially made, you make it yourself. Uh, here you could see, maybe because of the fact that I'm working on the porcelain itself at this point, the exposed porcelain and not the glaze, you could see what I've been doing this entire time. I am picking up a little bit of this uh, two-part epoxy putty, this alternative sabi. I am uh, picking it up with the back of the palette knife like I am now. I'm pushing it into any cracks or voids that I notice, and then I'm smearing it in as best I can, and then going through the process of then using either the back side of the palette knife um, or, or the knife edge side of the palette knife to uh, remove any excess. Um, you know, pressing it in, making sure I have good compression, good fill, and then using the, the, the knife to uh, remove any excess. And the great thing with the back of the palette knife is, is it build, as it builds up material, I can use that material to push it back into the cracks or scrape it off and use that material to fill up a different area of loss. Now, at this stage, I have filled almost every area of loss that I've noticed on this ornament. So I'm going to do some last minute cleanup with my palette knife. And then I'm going to go through the process of further refining this putty. Uh, this putty, like I mentioned earlier, it has approximately an hour working time uh, before it gets to the point where it's hard to work with. It's a, yeah, Honestly, it's more like 30 to 40 minutes before it starts to get stiff, hour of... of time where you can push it and move it around and after about an hour and a half, two hours, uh, it is a sandable surface. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to use just a little bit of water and the water will actually slow the cure and some really fine sandpaper. Uh, here I think I'm using a thousand grit and I'm going to be going through the process of just sanding off the entire surface and what I'm doing is I'm just removing any uh, excess uh, material with the sandpaper uh, and, and water. Uh, what you'll notice is that it becomes a, a pink paste. I want to make sure I wipe that off so I don't end up with any residue curing on the glaze itself. And then I'm just going to go through this process of sanding any areas where it looks like I might have a little bit too much excess and, um, and then going through and wiping off any of that residue created from the, the water and two-part epoxy mixture. Now, if this piece had larger areas uh, of loss, bigger sections where there might be complete missing material, uh, what I would do is I would fill the area um, along the edges, let it cure, and I do that a couple times until I have a good solid uh, backing to then do the final process of pushing in some additional sabi and then smoothing it over. So I may end up doing this process in two or three steps uh, if it is needed for uh, the amount of loss that I have to replace. Um, here again on this side, you can see there's a little bit of excess, so I'm using that sandpaper and water. You could also sometimes just use a sandpaper and damp, uh, or not sandpaper, I'm sorry, a damp paper towel, um, and just basically wipe and smooth off the surface. Um, you can sometimes fill this uh, with your fingers. I tend to wear gloves all of the time. I get really bad allergic reactions with epoxy. The funny thing is I don't get those allergic reactions with Rushi. Um, I, I, I luck out in that instance, but whether I'm using a Rushi or epoxy, uh, I do wear gloves. Uh, using a dry paper towel, once I have any of that done, I then go through and wipe off any excess. And what I'm doing is I'm looking at the ornament going through, just making sure everything is nice and clean. At this point, 
uh, in this uh, video, you're not going to see a whole lot of my damage um, in missing area. You'll see a little bit of red here and there. You'll see it mainly where the porcelain is. But um, as you can see, I have a pretty good fill now on that little front section. You can see a section where there was a whole section of glaze that had missed off. And then I'm spinning around, taking a double look, and then, oh, look, I missed a small little section of fill on the lip. Um, on the, what was a, uh, a cutoff area of the ornament when it was made. Um, and where the ceramic itself, not the glaze, but the ceramic itself, pressure flaked off during a break. Um, and so I'm going through and pressing some more in. Uh, letting it sit there just for a couple seconds and then going through and sanding the smooth and to smooth the surface out. Um, this will allow the piece to, again, look more professional. The more cleanup you do early on, the less work you have to do later. And so it's always best to spend the time early on making sure everything's nice and, and, and perfect. Now, if when I were to finish this, I would let it cure and I notice that there's voids or nicks and areas that I need to refill, I would just go through this process of mixing this alternative savvy again, this epoxy, two-part epoxy putty, and then filling the area. And typically, you know, when you're doing the work with uh, uh, savvy and traditional Arushi, sometimes you do these fills three or four times in order to make sure that you have a really good um, finished look on the piece. Once this is done, I would set this ornament aside for 24 hours and let it cure before I touched it again. At this stage, the ornament has been glued together using the two-part epoxy. That sabi has been used, the two-part epoxy sabi alternative has been used to fill any gaps or chips or missing material. I've then let it cure and I've sanded and cleaned up the surface to ensure that it's nice and smooth. If I run my finger over the edge of that uh, repaired and cured surface, it feels pretty uniform going from the glaze to the repair back to the glaze. There's not much that I feel in the way of imperfections. Um, at this point, I have the same two-part epoxy that I had before. I'm following the mixing ratios that came with the epoxy in the packet uh, just to make sure that my uh, epoxy does cure properly. And I'm going to go through the process of mixing this epoxy again. Uh, I am going to show the mixing uh, again because in the first portion of this uh, tutorial, I showed mixing with a toothpick because of the small amount of epoxy that I was using. Here I'm going to be using a little bit more epoxy because I'm using this to paint on the surface. And I'm going to show you the process that I use with a palette knife. Um, I do typically do this on a ceramic or stone tile. This happens to be a, a composite tile uh, to imitate stone. And what I'm doing is I'm going through and I'm mixing those two parts together, scraping them off the back of my palette knife and going back and forth this entire process. I do spend a fair amount of time doing this, several minutes typically. And once I'm done mixing the epoxy, I make sure to clean off the palette knife as best I can. Now the biggest mistake that I see beginning Kintsugi artists make is they load their brush with a ton of material and then they paint it on really thick and then it either runs or it applies uh, too wide. What you want to do is you want to run your brush through your adhesive material, in this case epoxy, and then wipe it off so that you have your brush and bristles loaded but not with an excess amount. The thing that you want to do when you're painting your lines is to make sure that you have good, nice, even fluidity and you're trying to paint over your repair that you see. Uh, in this instance it is a little bit hard to see because it is a black ornament, but what I'm doing is I'm painting straight on top of my previous repair. So I'm following the epoxy line that I can see. If this was done with Arushi, uh, Ki Arushi and Mangara Arushi have color to it. It makes it a little bit easier than it does with epoxy to see your previous repair. But you know, take the time to look at it in good light for what you can and paint a thin line over the repair surface. And literally you don't want to go much wider than your repair surface because the adhesion on that repair surface is best as opposed to the glaze of the ceramic piece. Uh, one thing that you'll notice I do when I'm dragging my brush is you'll see that I anchor my hand on the surface of the ornament using my pinky. That pinky extended and touching the ornament surface gives me some stability so I could have a nice fluid stroke with my brush. As I go through, I try to bend the brush ever so slightly and drag it along that crack to best I can. You know, every now and then you do want to periodically check your work, see how it is. Uh, you'll notice that I will go back to a previous uh, line and pull through, try to get that material a little bit thinned out. And then here I'm rotating the ornament to a different side so that I can get that brush still moving in a nice even line. And again, you'll see that pinky extended out holding on the glaze 
uh, part, portion of the pottery in order to help stabilize my hand. Now, the thing you do want to make sure that you're doing, if you are doing that, and I do suggest you do that, is that you're not putting that pinky into an Arushi uh, area where you've painted a line because then you'll smear it and then when you get to your gold application, it ends up becoming problematic. And like I said earlier, you do want to periodically check, look at the ornament, make sure that your repair is coming along, make sure you don't have any lines outside of your repair area. And if you do, you can go through and always wipe that off with a, a clean rag. Uh, sometimes you might have to wipe off the entire surface and start again. You don't want to leave any extra residue. Although if you do, it's not all that big of a problem. Once the gold is applied on the surface and it has cured, you can always go back and sand off any excess and clean up any excess, either using a nice sharp X-Acto knife, a palette knife, and or some wet dry sandpaper. Uh, again, that stability of the finger is essential. The other thing that you'll notice that I do do while I do it is I will constantly go back after I've loaded a brush and I pull the line, I will go back with that brush again without adding more adhesive and start a little bit higher up where I've already done it and pull through again. Again, I'm trying to get a relatively thin surface here. If it's too thick, it's going to flow and move down the piece. The upside with both uh, Hirushi and this long cure epoxy is it takes time to cure. So you have a lot of work time. The downside is if you apply it too thick, it is going to run, in which case you have more cleanup work to do after the fact. Here I'm going to go through and now that I finished my line and start a little bit higher up and go through again, just trying to make sure I have a thin and even coat throughout this entire repair. Once I'm done, I'm going to look at it check to see how it looks and then I'm going to set this ornament down. Everything looks nice and good. Set it down and let it cure for about 15 to 20 minutes. Now that the epoxy has had time to sit and partially cure, it's, it's not fully cured in any way, shape, or form. I just want it to partially cure because what it does is it allows the epoxy to become a little bit more tacky so I don't waste as much material. If I was using gold here on the gold application, the gold is really expensive. An ornament like this may take $20 to $30 of gold. Um, here, because I'm using the brass powder, it's not quite as expensive, but you want to let it cure because otherwise what ends up happening is that metal sinks into the repair surface. And then when it sinks into the repair surface, it ends up wasting a lot of material when all you're really trying to do is get your uh, me metallic powders, your gold, your silver, your platinum, or in this case, my alternative gold brass powder. You're trying to get it partially embedded into the epoxy surface or traditionally into the Bengata Arushi or white Arushi surface, depending upon the material you're using, so that there is a portion of the material that's above the surface, a portion of the material below the surface, and then it gives you the ability to burnish it after the fact. What you'll see I'm doing here is I'm picking up my alternative gold dust out of my little vial here. Most of you probably got it in a bag. What I like to do is pour it out on a piece of wax paper if I have a bag, um, or I can just get it directly out of the bag, but it keeps it a little bit cleaner if I just get a small amount on a piece of wax paper. And what I'm doing here is I'm loading my brush with some of that powder, and then I'm holding it about a centimeter to two over the surface and slowly tapping the brush with my finger. That tapping of the brush, what it does is it causes that metal dust to rain down on top of this adhesive. This technique here is what is uh, indicative of true kintsugi that's done by someone who knows what they're doing. It's not mixed in with the epoxies, which affect the cure of the epoxy, although traditionally Rushi would have been used instead of epoxy, but it's this dusting of the surface that gives it and leads to a good quality Kintsugi repair. This technique is actually called makie, and it is translated to sprinkled picture. Maki being sprinkled, e is picture, um, and, it, and it's the means of this application. Loading the brush, holding it over the surface, tapping it, and letting it sprinkle down. There's a couple different methods that get used with Kintsugi. Um, some people use a, a tube that's uncovered in silk that gives you a finer mist. It like, sometimes can give you slightly cleaner surface. And other times, uh, uh, people will use uh, Mawata itself to do the gold. I've never had luck with that. The brush is one of the better of the two, three methods that I think. And now that I've applied the gold, I'm going to go back through and I'm going to brush off any excess. What I'm doing is I'm not trying to touch my repair. I'm trying to slightly go over the surface of the repair and remove any of this excess material. If this was gold, I'd be a little bit more colorful, trying to make sure that all my gold landed into uh, my gold paper here. This gold paper is a wonderful material, and it's just like weighing paper, and, and it's non-absorbent. And what it does is it allows you to store 
uh, the metal powders without really losing much. Weighing paper in the U.S., I haven't found something that is quite as good of a quality. The best stuff that I have found is only in Japan. Um, and, and if you're using real gold, real platinum, or real silver, it will come wrapped in this type of gold uh, weighing paper. So you always want to make sure that you retain your materials. For the sake of this video and to highlight where the gold powder has been applied and where the epoxy is underneath, I'm giving some slight little blows of air and just so you can see the repair. It's not something that you should do. You should be wearing an N95 the entire time, but it does sort of highlight the areas uh, for this video. Okay, the ornament has now cured for eight hours. Um, I'm grabbing my Moata. Moata is silk fiber. Um, that you basically make it into a cotton ball. Uh, unlike cotton, uh, Moata does have a natural oil in it which aids into the polishing and burnishing of the materials. You typically want to do this within 8 to 24 hours of uh, applying the gold. After about 8 hours, the epoxy should be cured enough. Um, and if you were doing Arushi, you can do it within about 6 hours. It's cured enough that it won't smear. Um, and still uh, soft enough that it gives you ability to, to align the metal by pushing it with this uh, uh, Mawata and, and getting a little bit of natural oils on the surface. I apologize for the blurriness of this video. I was having an autofocus issue with my uh, camera at this stage. But all I'm doing is I'm going through and I'm wiping off any excess uh, material on the ornament itself outside and on the repair and then going over the surface, uh, the surface of the ornament giving relatively even pressure. Um, I'm going to try to get off as much of the powders as I can. Um, sometimes, depending upon what your glaze is and the humidity where you currently are, um, the gold powders may not come off completely with the Moata, but what you're really trying to do here is remove most of the excess that you can and then burnish that surface. Um, and literally it's just a little bit of elbow grease smoothing over and polishing the surface. Uh, when I'm done here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the ornament aside for a day. I'll come back to it the next day, and the next day I'm just going to do a nice little cleanup with just some, uh, sometimes Moanta, sometimes just a damp paper towel to remove the excess. Um, I'm done with my little polishing right now. I'm going to set it down, clean off my hands, and then let it sit for a day. Twenty-four hours later, you can see the end product from uh, my Kintsugi repair with uh, the Moata having burnished the surface. Now I'm going over with a damp paper towel, like I mentioned before, just to remove any other excess. And literally just going through and, and wiping it off with that paint, damp paper towel. If it looks like I'm having a harder area with uh, uh, some areas than others, I may go back through and use a little bit of the 1000 or 1500 grit sandpaper just to remove any excess that's not coming off of the damp paper towel, but a damp paper towel usually does the job. Um, if it doesn't, again, just reach over and grab yourself a small little piece of wet dry sandpaper. In this instance, I think I was using 1500 grit on this. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and remove any of that excess with that wet dry sandpaper. It doesn't take all that much time you know, a minute or two and I can get the surface relatively clean. I let the ornament dry for a little bit, dried it off, and now I'm going through one more time with a damp paper towel uh, just to remove any of this excess. You could see here some of that excess gold on the surface. I'm just trying to polish it off uh, as best I can. And what you can see right there is that gold repair so far. Um, it's nice and bright and clean. It's a really good surface on this ornament. So if we look at it in the light, you can see that gold repair. Now the difference between the brass and the gold is this brass is really good and as I rotate it around it still looks relatively gold. This was done with the 23.4 or 24 or 22.3 karat golds. Um, the color wouldn't change quite so much uh, as it rotated in the light. Put this ornament down for a second and grab some paper towel so that I can dry it off really, really well. Uh, making sure my hands are clean, have a paper towel that's 100% dry, and I'm just going to go through and I'm going to, you know, polish and dry the surface. As you can see, as I'm rotating and polishing the ornament, you can see that gold color, really nice quality, a gold color on this ornament repair using this uh, alternative brass, alternative gold brass powder. It's a product that I really like. If you see any excess gold on the surface, just go through and wipe it off. Uh, sometimes you can get a small little 
alcohol pad if it's still not coming off. But at this stage, it's just a matter of final cleanup and, and wiping the surface. If there's small little areas where there's material you need to wipe off, uh, you can use that Mawanta, you can use an alcohol wipe or that paper towel, but it's just a matter at this point of polishing and drying the surface to see what the end result is going to look like. Here that I'm done with my finer polish, we're going to look at the ornament and you can see a nice clean gold line where that ornament was broken in half running through that Temaku glaze. You can see on the bottom where that was a large area of loss that had to be compensated for. And then here on this front, you can see a couple areas where the line's a little bit wider where those pressure flakes had come off the piece. Uh, final ornament, uh, I have to say, looks overall pretty good. If there's anything else that needs to clean up, you know, use that small little piece of Mawata alcohol wipe or paper towel and wipe it off and then dry that surface down. And uh, that's the end of the ornament. And the last stage would be just putting the cap in. Now for the final assembly of the ornament. This ornament is different than the one that I repaired in all of the stages of the video thus far, and it's because the one that I had repaired I actually ended up selling and re didn't realize until after I sold it that I didn't do a final assembly video. So here I'm going to show with this uh, ornament. It has the same exact opening that you would have on any of the ornaments that you had. Sometimes there'll be a break transition through there, sometimes they won't. And then it comes with, and I should have sent with the kit, a uh, ornament clip. And what you'll notice is that it is a high tension uh, piece of metal wire uh, in a golden color. Uh, and what you're going to want to do is you want to squeeze those clips together so that they are a little bit narrower than the opening. And then you're going to slowly push it in and it will pop right in place. Once that's done, you want to assure that your clip is centered on the piece. And then you have a nice place to put a hook and have that hang up on the tree. Final ornament uh, looks nice and pretty here. I'll uh, attach some photos of the one that I repaired in the video with the clip on so that you can see it at the end. Um, but unfortunately, like I said, I don't have the video of that stage of the final assembly. I hope you've enjoyed this video of a Christmas ornament repair using modern materials. Uh, this is a, a what I would call a modern approach to Kintsugi. It's not traditional using traditional materials. If you're interested in using traditional materials, I do produce and, and provide uh, traditional Arushi and the materials used for traditional Kintsugi, um, like the ones that I use most often in my studio uh, here in San Jose. Um, if you have purchased this kit and you have finished your uh, ornament repair and you still want to use the extra materials in the kit because there is plenty to do multiple repairs for a food safe repair, you're going to want to add one additional step that isn't mentioned in this video. When you finish your uh, maquillé technique, sprinkling the brass on the surface, letting that cure polishing the surface with the mawata, and then cleaning the surface of whatever vessel that you have, uh, the final stage in order to make uh, one of these repairs FDA compliant is you do have to apply two shell coats of the FDA compliant epoxy uh, over the surface of the repair. What this does is it ensures that you have a food safe uh, layer um, in the final stages of, of your repair. It also makes to ensure that you don't have any brass powder or any uh, other materials coming off in the repair uh, after it has been done. After you apply uh, two shell coats, mixing the epoxy just as you did in other stages during this ornament repair, you're just gonna use one of those liner brushes and go over and try to give a nice, smooth, clean line over the surface of the repair. Let that cure for about 24 hours and then apply a second coat. Uh, once that repair cures or that second coat cures for seven days, your repair is uh, as good as it's gonna get. Um, if you ever have any questions uh, along the way or you run into problems uh, in your repairs, by all means, reach out, let me know. Best way to get a hold of me is via email. Uh, if you purchased a kit from me, my email is there. If not, uh, you can find my website, christiankbonner.com, um, and my contact information is there. If you're someone who's interested in having a, a Kinsey repair done, by all means, reach out to me. I do a lot of professional repairs here in my studio in San Jose. Um, if you're interested in learning how to do traditional kintsugi using arushi, I do get all of my arushi-based materials from Japan. There's one of three different manufacturers that I use, um, and, and I import all of those materials, including real gold, brass, platinum powders, uh, uh, anything that you'd be interested in, uh, in order to help you uh, with your procurement of uh, arushi materials and or just learning the process. If you're interested in, in being a, a participant in a workshop, uh, by all means, please reach out to me. For my studio in San Jose and my 
Moro behind you where I have things that are in the current process of curing. Um, I hope you enjoy this video. Thanks for the time today.